so um, to all our viewers, thank you so much for joining in today. My name is Shai, and um, I'm a product marketer at DC Cap, working for Chloris. And today we have the very wonderful Alex Weiner with us, and we'll be talking about B2B and video marketing. And um, I think that it's a very important subject, and um, I'll let Alex talk about it further. So Alex, take the stage. Thank you so much. Okay. So let's get this party started. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Alex Miner. I run a company called I Am Media. I've got some slides that that uh, we're going to be getting into in just a second. And let me make sure they're working. Okay. So B2B video marketing, there's so much to cover here and I'm going to try to keep it short and sweet. I don't want to take up all your day. I want to make sure that I'm actually giving you info that's useful. So let's jump right into this. And if at any time you guys got questions, drop them in the chat. I'll be doing my best to, to monitor that as well and, and make sure that I'm not ignoring you and giving you the information that you really want. So let me see if I can get this screen share thing going on. All right, so welcome to the crash. This is going to be a crash course in video business, basic training. And uh, also let me know, make sure that you can actually see this because it tells me that I'm showing you the screen, but I wanna make sure that you guys see the screen. So if you can drop it in the chat that you're seeing, seeing the presentation, that would ease my mind a little bit. Awesome. So the first thing that you so the first thing that you need to ask yourself when it comes to video business marketing is what is it for? What do you want to use video for? And for me, there's three basic four basic uses, and that's education, entertainment, marketing, and sales. And under each of those, you got some sub things. So under education, that's educating your prospects, training or process videos for internal use, customer service. Entertainment is entertainment, but what is entertaining to your audience is something that you will have to learn. Uh, for marketing, with marketing, a lot of people try to sell the widget. They try to sell the service. They're all about telling people about their products and the features and all that. When I think of marketing, I'm thinking more of branding and building brand, social media engagement, doing your content marketing. Because if you do that and you do that with a long-term plan, you will get the sales because you're going to build that trust with your end user. And it, it's, it all leads to good stuff. Um, when you're talking about direct sales for video. You're talking about product videos, commercials, sales funnels, those sorts of things. So then you gotta say, well, what kind of content are you going to produce? And there's lots and lots of answers for that. And for that, you gotta think about platforms. Now for me, these are the three essentials, right? Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn. If you're not on at least one of these platforms as a business, you're invisible, at least to me you are. Um, there are exceptions to that rule. There's always exceptions, but these are the major three to me. Facebook is still big, whether you're in B2B or in B2C. Uh, Instagram, same thing. LinkedIn, obviously for B2B is real big opportunity there, especially because the organic reach is huge and we'll get into that more. Um, but then there's also these three, YouTube, TikTok, Twitter. Those are other places that you can be. YouTube, I love YouTube. I think a lot of businesses don't use YouTube right, which is why I think most businesses, unless they're really going to dedicate themselves to learning the YouTube platform and learning how to leverage it properly, they really just need to stay away from YouTube because showing up on any of these platforms badly is going to make you look bad. Um, so at the beginning of your process, pick one to get good at, really study it and develop your content for that platform. And once you're really comfortable and you've got your workflow, you're in a groove, then you can start expanding to other platforms. A big mistake that I see people making is they try to jump on all the platforms at once and they don't show up well, you know, I, at 
at minimum, you should have one that you're really good at. I think every company, every brand, every personal brand should have at least two platforms that they're really good at or that they're spending their time on. Uh, you do not have to be everywhere. There's too many social media platforms and media channels for you to be everywhere and to do it effectively unless you have a whole team of people like Gary V where you're 20 deep and you can do that. Most of us do not. And with that, you got to know that consistency is king and also that I am not great at designing these slides because those icons should not be there yet. So with consistency, you got to pick a schedule that fits your life. So that means you don't necessarily have to be posting five days a week. You could be one day a week as long as you always hit that one day a week. The thing about consistency is that when you are consistent, it develops an expectation with your audience. They know that I'm going to see such and such as post on Monday at nine o'clock, you know, and so they will look for it. When you have that pattern in place, they know. They know where to find you and they will look for you. And when, and you will find out when you're super consistent and you miss a day that some people are going to contact you like, Hey, what's, what's going on? I, I didn't see your post today. Is everything all right? And that just will tell you that people are really engaged and really paying attention. Now, to help you with consistency, there are things that you can do. You can automate, you can batch content, you can hire uh, a videographer or a social media manager or a virtual assistant and also you really need to upload your content natively to these platforms and man I, I really did badly on this slide what is going on here so with Facebook um, and this is common wisdom these are not hard and fast rules when I talk about rules for these platforms these are merely suggestions you know you got to do what works for you you got to develop a strategy that's right for you for your business for your brand so nothing that i say is the end all be all you have to test these things you have to figure out what works for you what works for your audience and and what you can realistically keep up with so facebook if you're going to be on facebook consistently Post one once or more per day in the feed, whether that's a video or a graphic. Facebook stories are a big thing. If you're doing Facebook stories, two to three times per day is good because people will like follow your journey throughout a day. On Instagram, the common wisdom is that you post two per post two things per day max in the feed. Uh, long copy is encouraged, and by copy, if you don't know what copy is, that means the text that goes in your post, we call that copy. Um, and the reason that long copy is encouraged on all these platforms is because it makes people look at your posts longer. So the longer that you can keep people on your content, the better. The better, the better your chances of them actually engaging with your content or taking something actionable away from it. If you're doing Instagram stories, two to three times per day. Um, and IG is prioritizing stories and LinkedIn TV. On LinkedIn, most people say two posts per day max. For text posts, you definitely want to use up all the copy that you can because a text post is like a view is counted the way LinkedIn counts views is kind of confusing and they just changed a bunch of stuff in the algorithm. So yeah, we really don't want to dive into that. But um, text posts, use up them characters. I think you got like 1,350 characters. Use as much as you can, write as much as you can. Videos will get the most engagement. Um, they won't get the most views because LinkedIn is doing something weird with how views are counted on videos. So right now, if you're starting, if you're just starting to post video content on LinkedIn, you may think that you're not getting a lot, a lot of attention. But what you really have to pay attention to is the engagement. How many likes are you getting? How many uh, replies to the post are you getting? Because that's what really matters. The the view count doesn't really matter because with text posts, all that all that somebody has to do is scroll past it in the feed for it to count as a view with a text or a picture post. Um, videos, it's hard to get views counted, but percentage wise, you're going to get way more engagement on a video than you will get on a text post or a picture post. Um, and picture posts tend to get more engagement than text posts. People like visuals. And LinkedIn stories are a thing now. They're the hot new kid on the block. I don't have them yet. I'm kind of mad. LinkedIn, if you're listening, please enable my stories. And then with YouTube, 
I recommend one to two videos per week, at least one video per week if you can. Uh, they do have stories on YouTube, if you didn't know. They, they have a stories function on YouTube and search engine optimization on YouTube is crucial. Like you need to learn how to optimize your videos because the one thing that people really don't know is that, or you know, maybe they just haven't heard, is that YouTube is not just a video site. It's not just a social platform. It is a search engine. It is the second largest search engine in the world. And when you're uploading content, you have to think of it in those terms. If you're not trying to optimize your content for search, your content's probably not going to get found. Um, you can also run, you can also run ads on all these platforms that I was just talking about. Uh, but so, but uh, organic versus paid growth is something that we'll get into a little bit later. Oh. Okay, so I talked about automation, automation options for Facebook and Instagram. There is the Creator Studio. Um, that's something that a lot of people don't know exists. So if you have a page, like a company page or a brand page. Um, or an artist page, if you're, you know, a personality page, not a profile, a page on Facebook and Instagram, you can use the creator studio, you can upload content in, in advance, you can schedule posts out way in the future. And, and you also that's where you can look at all the analytics and stuff and, and get all that back end information. So if you have a page, you want to start being more consistent on Facebook and Instagram, Go to the creator studio take some of the tutorials figure out how to use it because you can if you can get all your content prepared in advance you don't have to be up there posting every day you can go on the creator studio schedule it all out and only have to do that once or twice a month youtube has the youtube uploader which has a function that will let you schedule posts in advance so you don't have to upload a video the day that you need it to go live you can upload it days weeks months even in advance and have that ready to go LinkedIn currently has no native option for scheduling. There are third party options like, uh, <clears throat> excuse me. <clears throat> there are third party options like Hootsuite, Sendable. Uh, there's a bunch of them out there. You just got to do your searching. But the problem with there being no native option for scheduling means that if you're not using a native platform to upload and schedule your content, the content is going to be hosted third party and that's no bueno. Now, this is the type of thing that makes me smile. For those of you out there, this is probably the stuff that makes you cringe, right? You're thinking, I don't want to get into video. It's complicated. I need all of this stuff. See, that that's me all happy about all the gear. You do not need this. So, this is the stuff for people like me who are uber nerds about video and photography and all that stuff. You don't need this to get started. If you want to hire somebody who has this stuff, it will do a bunch of the work for you. That's great. Yeah, see, that's y'all. All you really need to get started is your cell phone. And I'm sure you're sick of hearing people say that all you need is your cell phone, but it's true. That's why we keep saying it. And here are the pros about cell phones. If you've got a cell phone from the last two, three years, you're gonna get decent quality video. The cell phone is almost always with you. They're easy to upgrade and they do everything. The cons are limited capacity, limited features, limited battery life. And, and depending on what camera you're using, if you wanna use a camera, you may get some of those same cons. So how to get better video with a cell phone? Use more light. Look, where, where's one of my cameras? Um, so on, on your cell phone, the lens, the sensor is this tiny, tiny thing. It can't collect a lot of light. Cameras, even big cameras, need a lot of light to make pretty pictures, to create good looking video. So if you think about that and their sensors are so much bigger, this tiny sensor needs way, way, way more light to get a good image. So the first thing you need to do if you want to up the quality of your video on your phone is get more light. Second thing is to get a tripod or a stabilizer of some kind. Even a selfie stick can help because people hate shaky video. 
in general. And if you're trying to hand, and some of the phones now have a little bit of stabilization built in, but it's not going to be as good as the stabilization on like a phone or, I mean, on a, on, you know, one of these bigger cameras or a dedicated stabilization device. So tripod stabilizer of some kind, they make gimbals specifically for phones. Um, if you're not familiar with what a gimbal is, that's, it's a, mechanical electronic stabilizer device. Um, you can also get cell phone lenses. You can get lenses that are specifically made to use with your cell phone to get you different looks, get you better quality images. It's, it's kind of cool, all the things, that, all the ways that you can build out your cell phone. And this is just a picture. It's an example of some of the stuff that's out there. Uh, there's a brand called Sandmark. There's a brand called Moment that makes lenses for your cell phone. So do, do a little bit of research. If you, if you really want to get into it, you can, you can deck out your cell phone. So here are some of the accessories that I recommend. Manfrotto Pixie, $36. DJI Osmo Mobile 3. That, and these slides are a little bit old. They actually came out with a new gimbal within the last, I think they came out with a new gimbal. Um, but as you can see, these, these prices aren't extravagant. So $36 for a tripod that you can take everywhere and is also kind of like a handle for your cell phone, a desk clamp. I've got a couple of these, 25, 30 bucks on Amazon. Um, a video assistant, priceless. Also, audio is one of the biggest things when it comes to to uh, producing your video. People forget that audio is a big component of video quality. People will forgive crappy video, but if you got crappy sound, they're gonna turn it off super quick. So here are some microphone options that you can use to up your game when it comes to your cell phone. Sarah Monix got this tiny little mic that you can stick on the phone if it's still got a jack. Um, there are lav lavalier mics that still use a regular phone jack. Also ones that come with the iPhone lightning end on the end of it, or you can find ones that have a USB-C end or a USB-C adapter. And there are those cell phone lenses I was talking about. There's a, bu there's a bunch of cheap ones out there and, and a bunch of expensive ones out there. So if you have to go the camera way, which I recommend you start working with a cell phone first to see if you even like producing video, you know, here are the pros, interchangeable lenses, better quality features, ergonomics. Uh, the cons are it costs more money for that dedicated device. Batteries are expensive, file sizes are larger, and it's a more complicated workflow. If you have to go buy a camera, I recommend something from the Sony A, the Sony Alpha line, A6000, 6300, 6400, 6500. They've all got great autofocus. Uh, features vary between them. The 6300 through the 6500 do 4K, um, but they've all got great autofocus and there's a big selection of lenses out there. Don't wanna get too deep into that. Software you need to think about. You need to be able to edit your videos. Cell phones have software that you can use on them. Tablets have software that you can use on them. Filmic Pro, Adobe Rush, LumaFusion. Those are ones that I can personally vouch for as being good, but there's tons more options out there. Um, one that I know like Rich Cardona uses is called InShot. I've heard that's really good. I haven't used it, but I've heard it's really good. On the computer, Adobe Premiere, Final Cut, DaVinci Resolve. I feel like I'm talking about gear too much. Um, so we're gonna get off that real quick. Now, one thing that you need to do to make your content more easy to digest on the internet is captions. And these websites are some options for how you can get your content captioned. Uh, Rev.com is a captioning service. They charge about like a dollar, a dollar fifty, a dollar twenty-five, something like that per minute. Um, Subtitle, that's one that I use a lot. Clipscribe, Splashio. Splashio is cool because it's kind of like a done for you service where you uh, you send them your your video, edit it as much as you can. Um, they're not gonna take a ton of clips and edit them together for you. But if you got everything but the captioning and titles, you can send it to them. They'll do your captioning, they'll do your titles and they'll make it look cool. And the reason that captioning is a big thing is because a lot of people go through social media with the sound off. 
So if you've got captions, you you're giving yourself a much better chance of catching their attention. Uh, I know that I've been scrolling through my feed and I've watched videos completely with the sound off. I usually like the sound on, but if you got captions and something catches my eye, I might just sit there and, and read the captions for the whole video. So once you've got your content made, you got to think about distribution that goes back to platforms. And once again, we're talking about Facebook, Instagram, Google, and this is starting to get over into that paid media conversation. Um, and that's where we get into growth, organic versus paid. Now, there are pros and cons to each strategy. Organic growth, it's free. It's free. You got a long-term impact. The people who are following you are people who want to follow your content. The cons are that it's slow and it's limited by the algorithms on the different platforms and you got to learn the rules of the road. Um, you have to have a strategy in place on how to grow and you've really got to be implementing that consistency. You have really got to be doing all these things properly, engaging with your audience. Um, you really just got to be on it. And that's why I say if organic growth is your strategy that you really want to implement, you're a busy business owner or a busy person trying to grow their personal brand, eventually you're probably going to need to hire a social media manager uh, because it, it just takes so much time. Now, another thing that you really need to know if you're going to implement a social uh, organic strategy is how social media really works. Most people think that when you make a post, everybody who follows you see your post. So like this is a cube, I think of like 100 spots. Say you got an account with 100 people following you. You think you post it and this is what happens. 100 people see it. That's not what happens. Really, you got 100 people Instagram, for instance, might show it to 10 people. And then depending on how many of those 10 people engage with the content, they'll say, okay, this looks like it's working. Let's show it to some more people. They show it to 24 people. Now, let's say 18 people engage with it. Okay, 18 out of 24, that works. We'll show it to some more people. And they'll keep going through that testing cycle until they say, okay, people aren't really engaging with this anymore. And then they'll stop pushing it. Um, with paid media or ads, the pros are that it's fast, there's unlimited reach, and there are tools for targeting and retargeting that can allow you to get to the people that you really need, the people that you want to see the content. And also, there are better metrics. You're going to get information back from doing, from doing paid ads. You're going to see more information about who, if you're doing video, who watched it? Uh, well, maybe not who watched it, depending on the platform you're on, but you're going to see like how much of the video they watched, uh, how many people saw the video in their feed versus who watched it. Just tons and tons of information that you can use to make intelligent decisions about what you want to do going forward. Data is everything. You need information to make intelligent decisions. Without information, you're just playing around. The cons are that Paid ads are disruptive, they're intrusive. People didn't ask to see this content. You are pushing the content on them. Now, if your targeting is correct, the people who are seeing it are only gonna be people who are interested in the types of things you're talking about. So they probably won't be as mad about it. But if your targeting is wrong, not only are you gonna be wasting your money, but you're gonna be getting people mad at you because it's not the type of stuff that they wanna see. And it's also limited by your budget. The more money that you got to play with, the better your results can be. Um, but then, like I said, you got to have that good content. You got to have that good targeting. And you've got to know what it is that you want your ads to do at the beginning of the day, at the end of the day. Are your ads just to increase awareness? Are your ads to sell a product? Are your ads to get people over to your website? What is it that you want to do? You always got to think about what the goal is before you start <clears throat> Man, my throat is dry. You always got to think about what the goal is before you start taking action. But I don't want you to not take action because you're thinking so hard. I would rather you start taking action first and figure out what your goal is along the way rather than wait for the perfect moment to take action and have a fully formed plan because you're going to learn as you go. And, and that's going to 
mean that as you grow, as you gain more knowledge, you're going to make changes to your strategy. Your goals may change. Your business may change. You're not the same person that you were last year, you know, and your business shouldn't be the same as it was last year. Your business should be growing and changing and adapting and, and making sure that it's giving the clients, the customers, the audience what they want. And this is how paid media works. You can get all the people plus more if you're doing things right. So talking about getting started, strategies to create content. Document, don't create. If you don't know who Gary Vaynerchuk is, I really suggest that you follow him. He says a lot of great stuff. And when you're listening to him, you might hear a lot of the same things that I'm saying. He he knows what he's talking about. And, and we think alike on, on a lot of things. Um, so the basic premise of document versus creating, a lot of people get stuck because when it comes to creating content, that word create is scary. People think that they're not interesting. People think that they don't have talent. People, people judge themselves so harshly when, uh, if, if people, if normal everyday people weren't that interesting, reality TV never would have worked. Um, normal people are interesting and we're nosy. So we want to see what's really going on. So you can, your whole premise of your content can just be, be, be showing people what's going on behind the scenes, how the business works, how you do what you do, what it's like to be you, to do the things that you do. That is valuable to people, even if it's only other people who want to do the things that you do. You don't know, you could be inspiring somebody with your next piece of content. So try to get unstuck from that mentality of having to create things out of whole cloth to be super creative or super cinematic or do something that no one's ever done before. Cause there ain't nothing new under the sun, right? And at the end of the day, there's going to be somebody out there who's done the same things that you're doing, who has the same kind of ideas that you're having. And there's nothing wrong with that because they've got a different audience than you. A lot of people also get stuck because they think, well, I don't want to do the same thing as somebody else. Whatever move you make, somebody else has already made it. So get off of that. Um, but they probably don't have the attention that you have. They probably don't have the audience that you have. They probably don't have the same goals that you have. So it's all right if you're putting the same information out there because you're a different person. You're going to relate it in a different manner. Or even if you try to say it the same way, it's probably going to come off different. And the people in your audience are going to react differently to it than the people in the other person's audience. So there's nothing wrong with putting the same information out there. You might hear a uh, you might have heard a saying that says, steal like an artist. Well, I want you to steal like a content creator. Don't be afraid to take an article that you saw that you found interesting and repost it. But when you repost it, put some commentary on it or make a video about the article. Like if, if you hear a really dope story, tell that story in your video. Like there's nothing wrong with reusing what's out there. Because like I said, you're going to have a different set of eyeballs on it. So back to video production tip like i said before cameras require tons of light especially cell phones if you can't afford lights use big windows go outside people like seeing the world and they like seeing the world from your point of view don't take that away from them everybody can't be like me and, and live in a cave with fancy lights uh if you're shooting outside don't try to fight the sun one mistake or even when you're inside and doing zoom calls and things like that don't try to fight the sun one mistake i see a lot of people making is they go outside and they shoot a video the sun is behind them they they're in a zoom call and the windows in the background and the sun is just blazing so they look like a shadow don't try to fight the sun light yourself from the front make sure that you are the brightest thing in the frame. If you're outside, try to do your shooting in shadow. So if it's high noon and the sun is blazing, it's not so intense. Because even in the shadows outside, there's enough light bouncing around that you can get a good image. Shooting indoors, if you can, have a permanent video setup. Um, having a permanent or semi-permanent video setup will increase your output exponentially. Because one thing that we as humans hate is friction. 
And, and that goes for clients and customers too. They hate friction. The harder you make it for somebody to do something, the less they're inclined to do it. Uh, unless you're hard-headed like me, because I, I do video the tough way. Like, don't, don't try to be like me. I do video the tough way. Do video the easy way, all right? Um, so the easier you can make it on yourself to create the content, the more likely you are to create the content. Um, so I didn't make a slide, a slide on this, but it's something that I really want to touch on is missed opportunities for content. This happens all the time. It happens every day. Look, every Zoom call that you're on, and I know most of you who are on here that you do Zoom calls, obviously we're on Zoom right now. Every Zoom call is an opportunity for content. Every business meeting is an opportunity for content. Every time you hang out with associates and stuff is an opportunity for content. And it doesn't have to be super complex. The whole point of stories and the reason that people love stories is because they're raw most of the time. Some people get really, really into it and do a whole lot of production and stuff for their stories. The whole reason I haven't really gotten into stories yet is because I know that's the way that I would go and I ain't got enough time as it is. But most people are doing really simple behind the scenes type stuff, in the moment things. And that's not just for stories. Your regular content can be that way. You, your content is only as complicated as you make it. It can be super simple. It can be pulling out your cell phone and saying, yo, I just came out of a meeting and this is what I learned from the person who I was talking to. And, and that could be a life lesson or a good story that could be a great video. Another thing, um, and going back to what I was talking to, talking about where some of the roadblocks that people have for getting started, stop thinking that you know what good content is, okay? Or that what you know what quality content is. Let the world tell you what quality content is. Uh, because you could put all this time into it, and I was saying this to a client the other day, because they wanted to, or a lady who, who called me, she wanted to create a course, but she doesn't have an audience yet. And she wanted to create like 60 videos or something. And I was like, I don't want to take your money because you haven't developed your audience yet. And I don't want you to pour thousands of dollars into creating this gigantic course. And then you put it out there and nobody wants it. Um, you have to let people tell you what they want. You have to let people tell you what's good. And that's why data is so important. That's why metrics are so important. You have to put the stuff out, let people react to it, and then observe. You know, what worked? What didn't work? What did they like? What, what went viral? What got good response, good engagement? What failed miserably? You have to let people tell you. You can't think you know all the answers because you don't. Um, especially if you never gave people a chance. So I know it's scary. I know it's can be a big thing to put that first piece of content out there, but your first piece of content could be something as simple as saying, hey, this is my first piece of content. I'm trying to be consistent at this. This is a new world. LinkedIn, especially people love that. That's an easy win. Uh, is that really the end? I got through them slides fast, dude. Hmm. So then. Questions, anything, everything is on the table. Let's go. Thanks for the wonderful presentation, Alex. I think that was so insightful. Uh, we'll be opening the question deck for now. Um, if anybody of the viewers or attendees want to ask uh, Alex questions, you could just put it in the chat. And um, I mean, he, he can see that over there live while he's talking to us. So uh, he can just answer them right away. So um, you guys are free to do so. So, so meanwhile, the questions come in. We, we created some of our own questions as well. So if you're comfortable with that, we'd like to ask you as well. Yeah, go ahead. Any, so, any and all questions. Right. Let's go. So let's talk about a bit of a B2B content strategy, as you said. So one of the things which um, you know new startups actually struggle with is that they don't really have a lot of things going on to actually document them in the first place. So Wrong. Whether, okay, so what would be the, uh, the best route to make it in a way where they're looking, uh, in a way where uh, documenting seems like in an authentic way and not actually just doing it for the way, for the sake of doing it. Um, for startups, especially the, the basic strategy that I would tell that I, 
you know, and this is dependent on industry. Like if you got something where it's, you know, hush, hush, trade secrets and stuff that you don't want to reveal. I understand that. But for startups, especially the startup is the content strategy. The fact that you're a startup, um, you know, take people behind the curtain, show them what you're doing, tell them why you're doing what you're doing, tell them what you want to accomplish and, and take them along with you. Uh, people like to feel emotionally invested into things, right? It's all about building trust over time and building confidence over time. So show them what you're going through. Tell them about the mistakes. Tell them about, you, you know, a lot of people use social media as a highlight reel. They only want to show the victories. They only want to show the wins. But if you can, if you can show them everything, you know, show them the good and the bad and the struggles that you're going through, they're more likely to trust you as an honest person, as an honest organization um, when it comes time for them to need the services that you provide. So one of the questions we got from Remy is that, would you, would the same video for work for LinkedIn and Instagram? Sometimes. Uh, there are different audiences. There are different audiences, different types of people use LinkedIn versus using Instagram, right? So one of the things that you need to be aware of is context. Uh, the, same the same raw piece of content might work on both platforms as far as like what's actually in the video, but what you might wanna do is change the copy, you know, because what people are looking for in the text is gonna be different on LinkedIn versus what they're looking for on Instagram. Uh, and, and so if you're in both places, you gotta know what the audience is like in both places and, and tailor the content kind of to fit those people. So does it also affect the metrics, as you said, the uh, viewers and the, um, the amount of other in information that goes into it? Because since the platforms are different, the algorithms must be different. And hence the, you know, the metrics are affected by that. Or is it just the right? Same? And so and so and to go into that, another thing that you got to be aware of is what what makes what tells you that a video is successful on each platform, right? Uh, like for instance, my most successful video on LinkedIn uh, was a video about hashtags. I put that out and got, I don't know, something like 2000 views in a couple of days. Um, probably like 14 or 1500 views the first day. So that was great. Um, on YouTube, I put the same video, I, I reformatted the video a little bit, put it out on my YouTube. On YouTube, it's only got like three or 400 views. It's been out for the same amount of time. Um, but business content like that or LinkedIn specific content doesn't do as well on YouTube. But I know that. So the video is not a failure, but it's not, it's not, it didn't do the numbers that it did on LinkedIn, but it's not a failure to me because it didn't get the same numbers. I know the context of the platform. I know what works on that platform better. Um, I have not built up a business audience as on YouTube as much as I have on LinkedIn. On YouTube, my audience is other filmmakers, uh, people who are trying to get their filmmaking journey started. I talk a lot about gear and production and, and you know, how to save money on, on all that stuff. So, you know, you got, you as just as important as the context that you're putting the content is, is the context of the platform and how people respond to the content. Right. So we have one question from Pransai Pierhol and he says, so I'm a content writer for companies. How do I make video content about writing, which actually sounds interesting? Because honestly, I just sit at the desk writing shit from other people, which I love, but <laughs> telling people about the horrors of ending on a preposition will kill them. Is it worth creating my blogs in video form? Uh, it's definitely worth trying and testing it out. Uh, and the other thing, blogging is a whole other deep ra rabbit hole that we can get into, blogging or vlogging or whatever you want to call it. Um, vlogging, it, one thing that you got to realize with video in general is it's a long-term strategy right? Don't expect to start making videos and instantly get results to have the cash start raining down the next day. Not going to happen. Um, unless like you're running ad video ads to sell a certain product and it's just something that happens to catch people's attention. Um, but with that, what I would talk about is the thought process 
to me, for, for what you do, see, to you, it seems boring. But the basics of what you do, and I might not get as technical as like prepositions and this and that, but the thought process of what you do is insanely interesting. Like as a content writer, I don't know how you do that for a living. Like creating video content, yeah, I can do that. But but writing content would drive me nuts. Or if I'm trying to get better at writing content, like learning from somebody who's in that business and does it every day, there are thousands of things that you know, things that go into your thought process that are second nature that somebody like me who is struggling to start writing content would find insanely valuable. So break down your process. Talk about how, how like, What's the first thing that comes into your mind when you get a new assignment from a client? You know, like if especially if it's something that you don't necessarily know about, but you got to write that content. Like, what do you do? What's your process? What are the steps? Like, what's your framework? All that stuff could be extremely valuable um, and to somebody who's trying to do what you do but also to people who don't do what you do and don't want to do what you do. It's going to show that you know your stuff. Uh, it's going to help build your authority in your space. And eventually, people are going to come to you because they can see that you know what you are doing. So we, we have this internal questions. I mean, I'm so glad tons of questions are pouring in right now. So thank you for answering them. We had this internal question that came, which said that what kind of video content would work for a budding software product? Um. For a software product, you need to show how your product, well, okay, a couple of, couple of different ways you could approach this. One thing that, that uh, one mistake that a lot of product-based businesses make is all their content is about the features of the product or like how great their product is. Um, and that information is great too. Like people need that information. They need to know about the features. They need to know how to use it. So tutorials, uh, you know, product featurettes, all that stuff, that stuff is great. It's needed. I want to know how the product is going to make my life better. How, how is it going to benefit me? You know what I'm saying? Not, but not just by the mechanics of it, like what impact is the product going to make in my business? Um, tell me a story about a company that used your product and it changed everything for them. Or, you know, or tell me about how the product came to be. Like, what was the inspiration? What's the story behind? There's always a story behind a product, you know, like, especially if it's like a new software thing, like, where did you come from? You didn't just emerge from the ether with this product whole, like there, there was a, a process that came with developing this product. Uh, so tell me about that. Tell me stories, make me involved, make me care, um, but also make your content, keeping your, keeping your mind on the, on the end user and what they need, what they want, what they are looking for. Like, how is your product going to change things for the end user? Right, I think I think that's so insightful, and um, I, uh, we, we still keep we're getting good questions right now. Well, one of the things is a quick question by Remy. He said that how do how do how do you get the title bars across the top and bottom of your videos? Uh, there's different video editing softwares that you can use for that. I use Adobe Premiere. That's one of the professional level video editing softwares. But there, but um, I was talking about InShot. Uh, Rich Cardona uses that. If you know who Rich Cardona is, I know he uses that a lot. That's one that you can do that stuff in your phone, I think. Um, Adobe Rush is another app that you can use on the phone. Uh, LumaFusion works for uh, Apple-based tablets. Um, th there's a ton. There's a there's a ton of apps out there that you can do video editing on your phone or on your tablet. Um, as well as being able to do it on your laptop. But like I said in my presentation, there's also some, some sites that you can use that will let you do that. Um, one that I use a lot is Zubtitle. It, I I'm spoiled because I'm a video editor and I can do all this stuff myself. Um, 
but uh, Zubtitle will let you do it. Clipscribe will let you do it. I've used Clipscribe. So Clipscribe, you can just upload your raw video in there. It, you can do the whole thing. You can do the you can do the bars. You can do the titles. You can do all of that. Um, Splashio, that service I talked about, they will do all that for you. If they're they're a little pricey, so I don't know if you want to go that route. But if you got money to burn. Um, um, you can use Splashio and they will do all that stuff for you. They, you send them your video, they add the captions, they do all that stuff. So Stephanie asks, what is your opinion on sharing content from a personal versus a business page? Is there a value in posting to business page and then share through our personal account? If we're talking about LinkedIn, sharing posts gets you nowhere. Um, and they're making changes to the algorithm right now. So maybe that's changing, but from what I've seen studying LinkedIn all year, um, shared posts, get no traffic. Um, and in general on social media, I am much more, I, I encourage people much more to post things to their personal, um, to their personal feeds rather than to business feeds. Cause people don't care about businesses. People care about people. Um, and in general, when people are on social media, unless they're a super fan already, they're not checking for content from your business page. They're just not. Now, if you build a strong personal brand that can feed people back to your business page, but in general on LinkedIn, especially, um, post, post to your personal feed. Now, if now on another platform like Instagram, it's easier to build um, a following on it on a business page or business profile because they're more on equal footing but on Facebook on LinkedIn per, go personal build your personal brand rather than trying to build a company brand now I'm not saying don't post any content to your company but the priority should be uh, and, and I mean it also depends on the culture of your company some folks some companies just ain't comfortable with people trying to build out their personal brand and that's fine that's a company call but um i personal brand is everything right now people are the brand um e even for a big corporate company people are the brand like how you treat your clients how you treat your customers all that is an extension of the brand how you show up on zoom meetings how that that's all an extension of the brand like the reason why i show up like this it's part of my brand um, I personally think the majority of the world is killing their brand on Zoom right now or on web meetings in general because they're they're not doing what this one day the kind of setup that I'm doing is going to become the standard. Oh, that's that's actually quite right. And I, I think most of the people that you said about personal branding going that route are slowly realizing that, you know, that their messaging and their positioning in the industry or in, even in their personal spaces is very much affected about the way they present themselves. So uh, that's that's a great insight there. We have, yeah, we, like one, one of the, one, well, just not to interrupt you, but yeah. um, sorry. One of the things, uh, one of my good friends, Lorena Acosta, Acosta um, taught me, uh, she's a personal branding specialist on LinkedIn. You should follow her. Um, one thing that she taught me is like every single interaction is a brand building opportunity. Every time somebody from your company talks to somebody else, every time they make a post, every time you put up a picture, every interaction, every like, every comment is an opportunity to build brand. Don't waste it. Right. No, absolutely true. We've got one more question with Fonse. He says, is there an optimum time length for video on LinkedIn? Okay. So the maximum time length for video on LinkedIn is 10 minutes right now. Um, most effective video or the videos that I think get the most views and engagement and whatnot uh, are somewhere between zero and two minutes. I've seen longer videos work. Um, and if you're doing live streaming on LinkedIn, I think you can just go as long as you want. But if you're posting videos on LinkedIn, shoot for a minute to two minutes. Okay, thank you. I'm just going to just gauge the room once again and ask if uh, any of our plan panelists have any more questions. They they can they're free to ask. We've got like five minutes more, and um, I, I hope Alex is comfortable answering your questions. So I'm an uh, open book, man. Yeah, that's great. So if uh, 
if you have any more questions, that would be great. One of the questions that came through in our internal team was that um, starting out, what would be better if we have a diversified yet consistent con content strategy or a, a theme specific and consistent conference to content strategy? So what what uh, what would work better in when it, we're trying to build a brand, particularly for a B2B space? Um, when you're first starting, you have to experiment. You got to throw stuff at the wall and see what sticks. Uh, keep in mind what your goals are. Like, like one, one thing that I do with some of my clients is we sit down and we try to map out three or four things that you want to be known for. Cause this, cause that can dictate your whole content strategy, right? Sit down, have a conversation with yourself, get out a piece of paper, write down between three, four, five, maybe even six Four is like kind of like the magic number that, that keeps it easy. Things that you really want to be known for. And these are these should be areas that you want to build your reputation in or already have a reputation in and that you know this stuff cold, right? And that's the whole basis of creating your content. You know, you can, you can have brainstorming sessions. Well, all right, this week we want to release a piece of content in this area. What do we know? What do people find useful? What, what do people need to know about our products that's in this content area? What do we want people to know that we know in this content area? Like you got to ask yourself these questions. You got to do some self-analysis. Um, but even when, you're, even when you're doing that stuff, you have to keep in mind what your end goal is, right? Because it's all good to say you want to build a brand, but what kind of brand do you want to build? What kind of culture do you want to reflect? What do you want people to think of when they think of you, when they think of your company? Because to me, brand is not brand is not the logo. It's not the colors. It's not all. Those are mechanical things, right? Those are just marketing materials. Those are assets. Um, to me, brand is how people feel when they think about your products, think about your services. Do they do they feel inclined to recommend you? Do is dealing with your company frustrating? Like all these things are part of your brand, um, even if they're not things that you intended. So you know, it's it's when when you start building, experiment, see what works, and also you got to one mistake that people make when they start is they don't do enough. If you think you got to do two, three videos a month, you probably need to do six. If you think you want to do, because especially at the beginning, volume, do as much as you can. Just do as much as you can, as fast as you can, without it impacting the way that you run your business, because that's how you're going to get data the quickest. You got to get people the opportunity to interact so that you can get their feedback, so that you can see what's working, what's not working. And once you start seeing those patterns, then you can start making those intelligent decisions, right? Right. Sounds sounds absolutely great. I mean, this is something that most of the people that we work with when it comes to marketing um, is that they struggle with identifying the kind of content they should be deploying and they're confused with trying a little bit of this, a little bit of that. But I said, I understand what you said, that the experimentation part of it is extremely necessary to ensure that, you know, you get that initial tracking ability to see what is actually sticking to the wall and not. Yeah, and, especially and, in the beginning. Yeah. So one last question, I think uh, we, we've got last three, four minutes, so we're just going to go into it. So one last question we have is that when we have a sort of defined a content strategy, or even if we don't have a content strategy, but we're still experimenting with a lot of content that comes our way, and that is written, that's video, that's audio, all that. So effective distribution channels, how, uh, how our distribution channels affects our overall marketing strategy when we say like going into podcasts and going into blogging and then having you know, masterclass sessions like these where we call in industry experts compared to having a more humanized or a personal brand, you know, like, like showcasing our employees or documenting our business. Do you think it's much better to have a culminating strategy of all those elements because that creates volume or is it better to start out with something, do what you can and go on to next when you can possibly do it. So what's the what's the route there? I think if you go for kind of that multi-pronged approach like you're talking about, it's going to make it, in the long run, it's going to make it easier for you to produce content be, because it, you don't have to worry about 
it being boring or that you're only doing one sort of thing. Like having options is great. Um, so, I, so I mean, if you've got if you've got the people, if if you've got the bandwidth to be able to do all those different things, do all those different things. Uh, more is better. But if, but it comes, you're still a business. You know, you got to be able to run. You got to be able to maintain. So if you if trying to do all that content means that the business is going to suffer, you're going to have to pull back. Um, I tell people to do as much as you can without it negatively impacting your business, right? Because I don't want you to create content at the expense of your livelihood. I want you to create content so that it will benefit your livelihood. Yeah, that's very inspiring. And um, I think that's quite accurate to what we've been discussing so far that everything should complement the growth of the business and marketing strategies too should cater to the advancement of your business and your time and your efforts so i think um i gauged the room and i think that's that were all the questions that we have and uh, uh i think you, you you brilliantly answered all of our queries as well so before we end the session um any of our viewers who would like to reach out to you or to know or learn more about you and your business what are your uh, messaging and connecting channels? Sure, you can find me on LinkedIn, um, especially in the new year. I'm trying to be on LinkedIn even more. Um, you can find me, and, and that's just Alex Miner. Just search my name, you'll find me. Um, I'm on Instagram, the Alex Miner, and I am Media E Y E A M M E D I A. Um, so Instagram, Facebook, also. Not that active on Facebook right now, but planning to change that. Um, yeah, those are the main ones. I'm, I'm not that hard to find. I'm also on YouTube. You can search for Alex Miner. Um, my YouTube been a little stagnant this year because COVID-19, but we're, yeah, yeah, it's a thing. Everybody's been affected by COVID-19. <laughs> yeah, I think it's it's great. I mean, uh, we will so definitely most of our viewers will reach out to you for your expert comments. So, uh, we just want to thank you, Alex, for taking out the time to be here to share your brilliant insights with us and to give us the time that we so hopefully needed. And um, thank you so much for being here. Hey, man, it's my pleasure. I love talking to people, as you can probably tell. <laughs> and and uh, like, I, I get a lot of I have a lot of fun doing these things. Thank you so much. Um, so we'll be ending the session now and uh, once again, thank you for being here with us.